cannabis lawyers uh, do have some things that they ought to know if they're going to call themselves a cannabis lawyer. Welcome to A Higher Law, a cannabis podcast from the Dykema Law Firm. I'm your host, Lance Bouldery. On the docket today, what does a cannabis lawyer do? Joining me is Dykema Senior Attorney, John Frazier. So, John, let's let's start with, uh, is cannabis really an area of the law or is it an industry? That's a great question. I know you and I have had this conversation, I don't know, more times than probably either of us can count. Uh, and it's kind of a mixed bag of a question. Um, I think in some respects, cannabis is an area of law and that cannabis law intersects so many different areas of law, but that intersectionality really kind of supports the idea that it's really an industry of practice to support in the same way that automotive law is an industry of, of practice that's supported by commercial litigators and regulatory attorneys and administrative attorneys and Cannabis law really isn't all that much different, except we have really unique uh, challenges that our clients face working in this space uh, in light of the fact that marijuana remains federally illegal. Well, and it strikes me, I mean, that that's really the starting point here, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, cannabis lawyers uh, do have some things that they ought to know if they're going to call themselves a cannabis lawyer. Uh, but at the same time, you need to draw on the expertise from a, a wide range of practices. But I, I think when you start looking at what a cannabis lawyer should know, really the five top things would be, of course, federal illegality, regulatory compliance and licensing, understanding the legislative and rulemaking process and how to change the governing statutes and rules, the economics of cannabis, and lastly, cannabis business operations and products. John, what do you think is is most important about federal illegality? You know, it really touches on every single aspect of the practice. It it may not be that every single day we have clients talking about the DOJ or concerns about what's going on in D.C., but it really permeates every single aspect of the business. So uh, I think probably one of the reoccurring themes for all of our clients who are currently operating is the implications of Section 280E of the federal tax code. Uh, that particular pr provision uh, disallows all deductions except for an operator's cost of goods sold, which really practically means that the operator is getting taxed on their on their top line gross revenue less their cost of goods sold, which uh, for, for the tax folks or the business folks out there, there's a lot of unfairness that goes on, especially when you see, you know, big major corporations just upping their spending to basically pay very little in, in federal income tax dollars. And you have some of these cannabis businesses that may be losing money uh, and are getting hit by a, an enormous tax bill at the same time. Yeah. And I, I think the way I, I frame it to clients to, to make it maybe a little easier than getting into the technical details is just recognize that when you're at the retail level, particularly in the cannabis industry, it's not uncommon to be paying an effective federal tax rate in the 70% range. Uh, and, and so you're absolutely right that that tax burden can immediately make what would otherwise be a profitable business uh, a money losing proposition. Uh, I think I also see the, the impact really in, of course, the banking space and access to credit as well. I mean, I think when we started our cannabis practice in earnest representing regulated parties instead of just advocating for, for changes in the law, uh, most of our clients were paying cash. Uh, our clients don't pay cash anymore. I can't think of a single one that, that isn't banked, but banking comes with extremely limited options and extremely high costs. And to the extent that bank loans are even available, uh, very high interest rates. Right. That's uh, it's a huge issue. And, you know, it really disproportionately impacts, I think, probably some of the smaller and medium sized players because that access to credit and working capital is very rare and very expensive to come by and, uh, in any other industry. That wouldn't be the case. So it's just becomes a constant source of uh, of the federal government's policies lurking in the background and in affecting day to day operations. 
Well, and on, on the back end, when you can't pay that tax bill uh, or can't pay those, those lenders back, uh, there's no bankruptcy. Uh, it, it's not a matter of walking into federal court and, uh, and liquidating under the bankruptcy code. Uh, it's generally assignments for the benefit of creditors or other types of restructuring uh, opportunities where you see, frankly, a lot of the failing businesses having to sell for pennies on the dollar. Right. The, the absence of getting that automatic stay in bankruptcy really makes it challenging for, for distressed businesses to have an organized workout plan to, to get things resolved. And that's because uh, the bankruptcy court will refuse to administer a bankruptcy estate that consists of Schedule One uh, federally illegal assets, which in, in the proceeds of such uh, Schedule One activity, which pretty much closes the doors to the bankruptcy court for these businesses. Yes, and I and I think the other thing we see is you know those insolvency issues all end up getting governed by state law, but really so does the entire industry. With federal illegality, we have a patchwork of regulations uh, among the states, and so to me, really the second thing that a cannabis lawyer has to know about is regulatory compliance and licensing uh, at a state specific level. So even where you have some multi state operators. Uh, it's very difficult to have sort of common practices that might comport with uh, the regulations in Michigan and at the same time, maybe the, the regulations in Illinois. Right. And even beyond the state level, there's there's hyper, hyper local uh, regulation that will occur of these businesses at the local municipal level commonly, too. So uh, you're not even just dealing with a patchwork of, of you know, the. 37 odd states that have legalized for medical. And I think we're at 19 states that have legalized for adult use. You're, you're, you're digging down oftentimes to local municipal ordinances that are about as inconsistent with each other as you can get. So uh, simple questions that clients may have oftentimes require uh, digging down, not just at state, state specific levels, but, but reaching out to local municipal governments as well. Sure. Yeah. So when we talk about then the third, uh, the third item that a cannabis lawyer should know about and understanding both the legislative and rulemaking processes, that's not just at the state level. That's also you have to be a municipal attorney as, as well and able to know how to influence uh, city councils or, or city actors. Uh, and you also need to understand that the, the state's legislative process. Uh, we've certainly been involved in uh, multiple statewide and local ballot initiatives to uh, legalize cannabis, but you have some states that might otherwise be ready to legalize, but uh, at least the population might, but the legislature is not there yet and they don't have a means for, uh, for statewide ballot initiatives. So you take our neighbor Wisconsin, for example. Yeah, it's uh, it's a constant source of, of uh, trying to figure out how do you make the dominoes fall where they need to fall to to line everything up, and everything kind of becomes an interesting um, strategy and game theory approach at times. And uh, Lance, I'm curious to hear, you know, what do you think are some effective ways that uh, that you've found in terms of lobbying the uh, on not just the legislative side but the administrative rulemaking side as well. Well, I think the administrative rulemaking side in many ways becomes more important. Uh, you know, I, I remember Michigan's regulators when they were finally standing up commercial licensure, uh, telling everybody that, hey, we're, we're building the airplane while we're flying it. And, and that's very much the case. And to me, the key is knowing who to reach out to in the legislature to uh, leverage those relationships with a state administration, with, an ex with the executive branch. So knowing who, uh, who has oversight of administrative rules legislatively is important. And, and most important is knowing the, uh, the players at the regulatory level and developing relationships with them. Uh, you tend to find often that uh, leaders of cannabis regulatory commissions come from liquor control or gaming or some other regulated industry, uh, th these aren't people who don't have a background in government already. So uh, if you don't have those relationships at the outset, they need to be developed. And that's really, you know, one of the, my favorite parts of, of working in this space is that 
the industry as a whole is evolving so rapidly that the regulators understand that the industry and the needs of the industry have to evolve quickly because they're all learning on the fly while a lot of new operators are learning on the fly. And so even in some of these more mature markets, you don't have a full-blown Sisyphus rolling the, the boulder up the hill endlessly and you know, only to bang your head against the wall. Uh, you do have, in, in my experience, government uh, actors that are receptive to getting constructive feedback from key stakeholders like lawyers working in the space and, and stakeholders in the industry to make changes that they think are better for the regulatory environment. Yeah, I, th I think you do see that evolution, and, and you certainly see that at the leadership level of regulatory agencies. It doesn't always necessarily trickle down to the regulation and enforcement officers uh, who you know, often come from a law enforcement background and sort of you know, making the case is really the way they view their job rather than helping an industry to, to develop. But we've got to have something to do for these clients. So it's good to have, uh, it's good to have, you know, um, you know, we get, we have places where we can make some inroads and then we get challenges and that's, uh, you know, that's okay too. And that's, uh, you know, part of what we're here to do is help folks navigate through that kind of messy tension that exists at times. Yeah. And we've certainly found that sometimes when you beat an agency in administrative hearings, uh, they will, the, the agency will change course uh, so that they don't continue to lose uh, themselves. Uh, let, I'd like to turn a little bit from sort of the legal areas that a cannabis lawyer must know to, to the business areas. Uh, certainly the, the economics of the cannabis industry are in flux as much as the regulatory frameworks uh, can you talk a little bit about what we've seen in states that have unlimited uh, licenses versus those where there are license caps? Yeah, so if there's an unlimited licensed environment, what, what we're talking about here is a, is a market where the state doesn't have a limit on the number of retailers or cultivation facilities or you know extract or processing facilities. And so uh, oftentimes those caps are set either at the local municipal level or, or not at all. And um, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of interest in this space. So you see uh, in uncapped markets, lots and lots of folks trying to, to get their foot in the door and trying to grab a, a piece of market share. And there are good things about that approach and there's bad things about that approach. And the bad can come when there's not appropriate supply and demand side economics matching up. That's something that happens as a market correction over time. But boy, when it happens, uh, it's real messy for the folks that find themselves as the, the losers of the of the capitalism contest. Yeah, I, I still remember six years ago when we were first doing licensing in, in Michigan and we had all of these folks coming in, laying out their wonderful business plans. And of course, as everybody in the industry knows, uh, they all start with we have the best grower in the world. He grows product unlike anything you've ever seen or experienced anywhere else. And, and so we're going to get a premium price for that product all day long. And, and you know, early on in a state's development, uh, certainly in Michigan, we did see uh, wholesale prices of $3,500, $4,000 a pound. Uh, but when we were talking to those, uh, those would-be investors and industry participants early on, you know, we continually pointed them to Colorado and, and Oregon and Washington and said, you, you need to be uh, stress testing your pro formas down to $850 a pound, not thinking that you're going to get $3,500 all day long. Uh, as it turns out, we were probably a little conservative in that advice because we've seen prices even below that point. Uh, and so you know, certainly uh, that sort of uh, that sort of price compression has been problematic. And, you know, while while it may hurt in the short term, I think that, you know, that's probably the sign generally of a marketplace that's starting to figure itself out, get a little bit more mature. And certainly it's going to lead some to some M&A activity. Companies that weren't lean enough to start with or didn't properly forecast for the compression will become acquisition targets for those that did. And the, the marketplace will hopefully correct itself out, but uh, 
something obviously we're very mindful of and, and watching. And it's something that all, all prospective operators in this space really need to be thinking about from, from day one is, you know, can I be profitable if times are great? Well, I, well, I hope so. Uh, can you, do you have a successful business or a sustainable business when times are really lean? And I don't think that's unique to the cannabis industry. You know, that's a, a broad scale uh, market reality right now is the, the prospect of a recession looms broadly for the entire U.S. economy. Yeah, and, and I think you also see, you know, certainly some states, I'll pick on California a little bit, where, where we have uh, clients and work. Uh, in some states, if the regulatory framework is not adequately clamping down on the illicit market, on, you know, storefronts that are not licensed, on growers and processors that aren't licensed, uh, that can really submarine pricing as well. Oh, no doubt. And that's an example of a, of a regulated playing field that, is, that has failed. When the regulated product cannot compete on price with the black market activity in any kind of reasonable way, you, you don't really have right healthy market economics now because you've incentivized illegal activity to the detriment of the folks that are trying to do things the right way and pay taxes and, and follow the law. And that's, that's backwards. And, uh, you know, that's something we're always mindful about on Balancing the amount of regulation that should be, per, you know, provided in this industry, where you're, you know, you're dealing with a federally illegal product, but also simultaneously ensuring that you're not using regulation to uh, incentivize illegal activity in the black market. Right. I, I think one of the common refrains we've heard from almost every client, if not every client, is, you know, why am I paying the state hundreds of thousands of dollars? in licensing fees and excise taxes and all of that and, pay, and paying for the privilege uh, to compete with an, an illegal underground industry that the state allows to continue to flourish. Yeah. And it's something that uh, is, is I, it's not unique to Michigan. It's not unique to California. This is, uh, this is an industry problem. And, um, you know, I know our clients and I think, uh, you know, maybe not just our clients, but I think citizens broadly are invested into making sure that this regulated system works. I mean, I think most states, when they're looking at a regulated, uh, you know, legalizing marijuana, the approach that's given and the, the bill of goods that's sold to a company, that legislation or that ballot initiative is, we want to take the illegal market, make it legal and tax it. Uh, but if you don't clean up that illegal market as part of that approach, all you've done is just created a regulated market that is set up for failure. Yes, and I, and I think the fifth thing that a cannabis lawyer needs to know is understanding cannabis business operations and, and products. And that's one where maybe that, that's really the case for the regulators as well should be understanding that, because otherwise that goes to, uh, to the point you just made. There's all these regulatory costs imposed. Uh, there's regulatory barriers to certain products uh, that are, are maybe unnecessary. Uh, but they're a, a reflection of the fact that even the regulators are still learning this industry. Right. It's, it's just fundamentally critically important to understand what it is your client is doing, how they make money, and, and the types of products that you're selling. It's, it's really challenging for you to have credibility as, as a cannabis lawyer working in this space. If you can't talk with the cultivator and understand, oh, well, you're going to grow from tissue cultures or clones you know, or, you know, with rare exceptions, seeds and, you know, how that, that, that plant moves through its vegetative life cycle into the flower life cycle and what, what the post-harvest procedures are and what retail looks like. It, it, it's really difficult to, to come into any space with credibility if you, if you don't understand those basic concepts of, you know, what it is. Now, I certainly wouldn't, I don't have a green thumb and wouldn't be in there, uh, doing a good job measuring nutrients, pH balances, but you've got to have that fundamental working understanding of what it is your client's actually doing to be able to relate with them and relate to the regulator too. Yes, know, know your client and, and know your client's business. So turning to that, uh, when you do have new clients uh, come in, what do you see as sort of the, the typical life cycle or the, the areas of practice and you know, sort of maybe even a step-by-step -step that that cannabis client needs to uh, needs to begin. Yeah, so I, I always like to start off every single conversation with a prospective client. 
what are their end goals, right? If you if they haven't thought about what what the end goal is, it's really difficult to understand how I'm going to help them get there. So, you know, whether that's I want to build a grow and I want to exit in five years once it's profitable, or I want to build this brand and I want to take it national, right? Those are two very different goals with, with very different strategies. Or I want to be a retail play with a franchise model, or whatever it might be. So it, it starts with there, and then. Uh, that's a good time for our, for our tax folks and some of our business folks to help get involved on what the appropriate entity formation or entities formation is and discuss tax planning. That's usually a conversation that involves the client's CPA as well um, or, or other tax professional. And then oftentimes that's a good time to loop in our intellectual property folks and start thinking about what type of brand protection should they be considering or what they're thinking about from that perspective at the outset as they're working to develop their business plan, move through all those next stages. And perhaps you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, if, if you differ there or, or where you go after, after that, that approach. No, I, I, I agree. I think some of the sort of early stage uh, assignments, as it were, you can vary the order a little bit, but absolutely starting out with, understanding the client's goals and objectives, and more importantly, making sure that that client understands goals and objectives. And how uh, much it's going to cost to get there, maybe most importantly. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we've seen from a lot of the sort of legacy cannabis players, uh, you know, people come in with no thought of, of exit strategy. It's just, I have great product. I'm going to continue to sell great product and, and, and that's it. And, you know, counseling those clients to sort of understand what the, the big picture looks like, uh, what the long term looks like is, is really a critical point of, of our job. Uh, in terms of sort of brand protection and uh, intellectual property planning, though, can you touch a little bit on how federal illegality affects that aspect? Yeah, so uh, you know we we can't escape it. It's the the theme of this conversation is that uh, it's it's always just lurking there in the background. So uh, federal trademark protection is not available specifically as it relates to the cannabis or marijuana products themselves. As a precondition to a federal trademark registration, you have to demonstrate that the the, the mark is being used in commerce, and uh, the USPTO has interpreted. Uh, that requirement to include another word, lawfully, that the, the product's being used in commerce lawfully. So they've taken the position that marijuana products are, are illegal under the Controlled Substances Act. So you can't get the federal trademark registration directly on the cannabis itself, but you could get it on ancillary products, maybe a website as it relates to services or information related to the industry, clothing, apparel, uh, smoking paraphernalia, right? ashtrays, rolling papers, pipes, bongs. Those types of things are, are generally fair game. Uh, and there are state-specific trademark registrations that are available in, uh, for states that have legalized marijuana. You can get the, uh, the trademark protection at the state level on the marijuana product themselves. So you'll want to talk to uh, a trademark attorney who's experienced in this space and has navigated through that kind of federal uh, labyrinth to make sure that you stay clear of, of what you need to stay clear of and, and try and carve out as much brand protection for yourself as, as you can get. Yeah, so tr trademark protection really is just that. It's, it's protecting the brand. It's, it's the name. It's the identity uh, that is, is trademarked. What about processes and plant strains and, and the like? How, how can those be protected? So patents are available. Uh, illegality is not a, uh, a disqualifier to securing a, a patent. And uh, frankly, the ability to actually what's called practice your patent is not a prerequisite to securing a, an issued federal patent. Um, many patents that are issued don't actually allow the holder of the patent to, to quote unquote practice the invention. And, you know, a lot of times that's because the, the patent builds on some earlier invention and they would need a license to help build upon that. But uh, at the patent level, there is no uh, disqualifier for the illegality. So if you have a process that relates to marijuana operations that is new, useful, and non-obvious, you may be eligible for patent protection on the process. Uh, there are plant patents available uh, at the USPTO level that uh, may be available for, for strain-specific genetics and, and those types of brand protections. So 
uh, really important, especially if you if you think you're building something from an IP portfolio um, that's scalable to, to be in contact with, with an intellectual property team early, uh, because the last thing you'd want to do is inadvertently disclose your patentable invention or process and then effectively have been deemed to have dedicated uh, your patent to public use as opposed to taking steps to protect it. Sure. I, I'm not an intellectual property lawyer, but I, I do find that aspect of, of this business just, just fascinating. And I look forward to a uh, podcast we'll have later that will dive into those topics more deeply. But so you have the client, you have a new client, they figured out what their long-term goals are. You formed the entity or entities that they're going to utilize. You've started the process of getting uh, brand protection and, and patents of any uh, IP that you, you need to patent. How do you then go about locating a, a real estate or a, a community in which to operate? So there's generally, I think, two schools of thought there. Either you're going to chase down and look at a municipality that's that's already done the legwork, at least you know as Michigan is concerned, uh, a lot of the suitability for locations is done at the local municipal level. I think that's a consistent theme across all the other states that have legalized. I'm not aware of anybody who's gone completely out of left field on that approach. So that's where that hyper localization comes into play. And so generally two schools of thought, you can go look for communities that have already quote unquote opted in and quote unquote green zoned properties that are suitable and go try and track down those properties and pay the premium that somebody wants for them. The other approach is Go make your own way. Go find a property that you think works really well for you and uh, go start meeting with the municipal officials and pitching them on what you want to do and invest the time and, and effort at the local municipal level to lobby them uh, to support your business and, and get you that ordinance that you need to make that property work. Yeah, I, I think that's that's critical. I think it'll be really interesting to watch Kansas this year, actually, because I think the, the last version I saw of draft legislation in Kansas actually would override uh, local governments. Now, presumably, you still need to uh, get you know, building permits and other, you know, uh, other sort of standard uh, governmental authorizations, but there isn't an ability for, for municipalities to opt in or opt out. I would expect to see that probably change as that draft yeah. moves through the legislative I, I process. I think the, uh, the municipalities out there uh, would be pretty pretty vocal about that. Uh, that's, that's a theme for folks that aren't municipal lawyers is that municipalities are very protective of having uh, their say in regulating what happens in their community. And uh, they push back on, on any attempts to, to curtail that authority. So uh, but that's, uh, you know, that's generally the, the two approaches. I think that makes sense. And uh, a lot of that has to deal with what, what's your time frame that you need to realize. And so if, if you want to be early and fast, you might be paying a premium to be, be quick. Uh, if you found something that you think you can sit and wait on and kind of garner that uh, support from the local municipal level, um, you know, there's for sure going to be a cost savings for you there, but it comes at the expense of time. Yeah, re real estate acquisition and and leasing is uh, incredibly important. It's uh, another challenge in this space because of federal illegality too, of course, because uh, even technically, even owning a facility and, and making it available or owning real estate and making it available for the production of, of cannabis products that in and of itself is a 20-year felony under the Controlled Substances Act. So as a consequence, uh, while we're aware of some mortgages uh, in this space, uh, they're not generally coming from banks. They're coming from, uh, from, from private, uh, private lenders. Uh, in, and then leasing, of course, becomes uh, an issue here, too. Uh, we often see landlords trying to get a share of profits uh, as part of their compensation that may or may not be legal depending on the state in which you're in. Well, that, and you know, the, the prospect of leasing too, obviously most of these facilities require significant capital investment uh, to, to get to a, sta a state where they, they meet applicable building code requirements for these facilities. And so if you're leasing, you have probably, you know, the overwhelming majority of your capital investment going to an improvement to somebody else's 
real estate that doesn't get to sit on your your balance sheet at the end of the day, which becomes a, you know, we've definitely got clients that have had to go that route, but I think it becomes a less desirable option. And uh, you see a lot of, I think, seller finance deals in the forms of land contracts or uh, leases with option to purchase or more, more exotic sale lease back agreements with, uh, with lenders um, buying the property, giving you funds for the capital improvements, leasing it back to you and giving you an option to purchase on the back end with their return and <laughs> monthly lease payments uh, built in to make sure that they've made a good investment on their end. Yeah, and we, we certainly, we represent uh, clients on both sides of that, of course. <laughs> uh, we represent some of the some of the lenders and, and private equity funds as well as many of the uh, licensees that are that are borrowing money uh, or raising capital through the sale of equity, uh, and you know there are often regulatory considerations, or almost always regulatory considerations around uh, capital raising in in this space. Uh, you may or may not be able to lend against a license, uh, depending on uh, on state law, and depending on whether that license is really a property right or not. Uh, you. You may or may not be able to lend without a, a lender itself going through some sort of state background review. And so it, it really varies. And uh, those, those capital raise, uh, capital raises are a huge, huge part of uh, our activity in this space. So a- after that, so now you've got your capital, you've got your real estate, you've got your IP, you've got your maybe form and your goals set. Uh, what's, what's sort of the next step there? So that's when uh, a lot of the application work will begin in earnest. And, and frankly, some of this may be happening in the lead up to the, uh, the build out. You know, you may be getting some preliminary license approvals um, as part of your due diligence of your, your real estate acquisition. Obviously, nobody wants to eat uh, a really significant expensive property cost for a property that might work. But we need to, we need more I's dotted and T's crossed. But once uh, once everything is done. Uh, during that time frame, you're getting your licenses uh, from the local municipal government. You're going to get them from from the state regulatory body and have some inspections. And you know, hopefully, those all go smoothly for you. And that's when the fun begins, and you get your license and uh, you start um, whatever line of, of business you're you're seeking: cultivation, retail, whatever. And that's when the the real fun uh, for the operator uh, begins. And um, uh, that's when our work transitions from application focus to making sure your ongoing operations comply with the regulator. And Lance, maybe you could talk a little bit about what what that looks like on a on an ongoing basis. Sure, it's yeah, it's an interesting breakdown too because I I think you can break down a lot of the the workflow into uh, pre licensure slash pre development activities and then. Uh, post licensure activities and and those post licensure activities, you know, regulatory compliance is is critical to have standard SOPs to have your employees well trained. Uh, part of the issue in this space, of course, is employee turnover is uh, insane in in this industry. Uh, most of the employees that a licensee hires, a majority of them won't be there after a year. Uh, and so really, uh, it becomes a challenge to make sure that all employees are compliance focused uh, and, and people make mistakes. And that's you know, sometimes a battle to get regulators to understand that, uh, that you know, somebody may have you know, keyed in an entry wrong in uh, a state seed to sale tracking system. Uh, that doesn't mean that the regulators ought to come down on that company because it's a, there's product diversion going. Yeah. You, you and I, I know we've both had that fight where, you know, I, I think I've always kind of uh, liked to call it a fat fingering. <laughs> I think we've all, we've all guilty of it, dialing the wrong number on the, on the phone or typing in just, you know, just a typographical error. And, um, you know, we've seen that lead to, actual issued regulatory complaints against licensees. And so, you know, obviously that's, uh, that's a concern that I have and that we've introduced human beings into this, uh, into this system. So the, you know, if the expectation is, is perfection, that's not an achievable goal. Uh, the, the goal that should be sought for is ensuring that that compliance is a priority 
making sure that when mistakes happen, that there's corrective action, and that if a mistake happens, what changes have been implemented from a policy perspective to hopefully catch this again, but it's impossible, right? You know, if the expectation is 100% compliance 100% of the time, you know, it's just it's just not possible. Uh, when you have human beings involved, it's not possible. No, and at the regulator level too, I think we see a lot of sort of the pendulum swing of moving from understanding that we need to be supporting an industry uh, and educating licensees on how to be compliant to, you know, the next week the regulator may say, no, no, now we're coming down on everybody, uh, you know, yeah. in, in an overly aggressive manner. Uh, and that pendulum swings back and forth. And, and so having someone who understands and knows uh, the regulators and the, the leadership at a cannabis regulatory agency really is, is key, right? And it harkens back to what we talked about earlier about how important it is to actually understand your client's business because you can't get into those nuanced, you know, detailed dis operational discussions with the regulator unless you actually understand, you know, what it is that led to the mistake and, and can help properly contextualize it in its proper place. Yeah, I, I never thought that I would be learning Bureau of Fire Safety Standards at you know, this point in my career. It wasn't really something I, I thought I'd ever encounter, but like many things in cannabis, uh, you have to be able to adapt quickly. After the facility is up and running and, and you've got your compliance protocols in place and, and all of that, uh, that exit strategy that you talked about early on uh, in terms of goal setting, uh, that really becomes important. I mean, at that point, we're, we're seeing sales of businesses, especially those that are struggling and, and can't go bankrupt. Uh, and, and at the same time, we have plenty of clients uh, that look at that as acquisition opportunities. I mean, folks who uh, were smart enough not to vastly overpay for real estate early on and let somebody else get the license. And now that they can't hold that license, you know, swoop in and and get that on the cheap, essentially. Yeah, there's, you know, it's a, it's a fine line to, to walk, right? Like you've, if, you're, if your intention is to exit uh, and, and be an acquisition target, you've got to be mindful and, and maybe exit a bit earlier than you think as opposed to waiting because that could, that could be a downside if the market takes a turn. And, uh, you know, there's always a, a, a nice kind of fine line you have to walk there. And if, if, if your business model is we have the capital, we're going to expand by way of acquisitions, then, you know, that will come with some some practical discipline that needs to be had to not chase the next shiny object every time it's uh, the opportunities presented in front of your face, but instead to, to really wait for that right opportunity where there is uh, a real value to be gained with a, with a targeted acquisition. Well, and, the, and that certainly requires a lot of upfront planning too. I mean, we, we've certainly seen... Uh, you know, smaller operators really be disadvantaged uh, in in this system, uh, and if they haven't thought uh, down the road and, and they haven't exited at the right time, uh, we see smaller operators now in multiple states that will try to sell and there are no buyers. Yeah, so it's having that kind of awareness of where you fit in the ecosystem. If you're the the big fish or the small fish, making sure you're eating or you eat somebody else at the right time, uh, you, you know, becomes really critically important. And it's something I think that, uh, you know, probably needs to be front of mind for, for a lot of operators, regardless of their size. Yeah, it's just simply good business practice. Absolutely. So, uh, so speaking of the business, just a, a, a little bit, let's, let's talk just briefly about the business of law to what, uh, what have you seen sort of change in, uh, in in the practice? What evolution? Well, I think uh, working as a cannabis lawyer is really uh, a, a unique and fascinating opportunity, especially for, for younger lawyers, because this is such a new and emerging industry that you have the opportunity potentially to be involved right right from day one. Like I, I know you and I both have, Lance. So, uh, you know, some of the biggest changes I've seen are that uh, – you know, I remember at the outset, you know, right when uh, our, our Medical Facilities Licensing Act passed in Michigan, there was a lot of concern among lawyers about whether or not counseling clients in this space would, would cause us to lose our bar cards, uh, given the, the implications of assisting clients uh, who are looking to 
potentially violate federal law. And, you know, thankfully we've, uh, uh, our state bar here in Michigan was, uh, you know, basically said, well, if you're helping clients comply with state law, why would you be concerned about your license to practice law here in Michigan? So uh, that was a relief, but uh, there, you know, there are other states that I don't think have been that, that generous with their interpretations of, of uh, their rules of professional conduct. So that's something that I think still weighs heavily for a lot of lawyers looking to work in this space. But uh, one of the biggest things that, that I think I've seen is that the level of sophistication of our clients has changed uh, significantly over time. And that, I think, comes as a function of uh, really just the maturation of the business environment here. A lot of the you know, big question marks we had on day one have been settled. So now we can move to the more kind of interesting or uh, more economically mature questions. I don't, what are your thoughts, Lance? No, I, I tend to agree. I think as the industry has really normalized and, and grown in terms of you know, overwhelming acceptance by the American public, some of those concerns are, are much less than they were. I mean, I, I think even you know, prior to Michigan, we were dealing with the same issues in Illinois and California in terms of regulation by the state bars and, and what they would say about it. Uh, you know, we certainly have attorneys in, in other offices and states that are a- attempting or, or poised to legalize in, in Minnesota and Texas that are still still dealing with those questions and, and issues even today. Wisconsin as well. I shouldn't leave them out. Uh, but it, it has been really a, a change in acceptance broadly. Uh, some of the business issues we had, we, we talked about earlier uh, clients that were uh, that were unbanked that were paying us in cash that that's that's really disappeared. Uh, we see much greater acceptance from the financial industry, much greater availability of insurance, uh, and and more standardization in terms of of contracts and, and licensing agreements and all the things that our clients deal with on a day to day basis. I think one of the other biggest changes I've seen, too, is the reception that I get from folks when I tell them I work with, with cannabis clients. Uh, f- five years ago, there was a lot more uh, eyebrow raising, you know, wondering what, what the heck do you actually do? Or, you know, or, and, and now uh, I think that, that public perception has changed to say, well, oh, wow, you're, you're actually engaged in a, a really interesting and, and cutting edge area of law, you know, in this multi-billion dollar industry. So you, you must have... Uh, a really fascinating practice. Yeah, and I, and I think the nature of clients, is, as you pointed out, that's changed too in terms of the level of sophistication. Uh, I remember 2006, really starting in 2006, we were the ballot uh, council for the passage of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. Uh, and, you know, we, we thought like many of our practices, here's the four, we'll be at the forefront of this new regulated industry uh, it, it passed at the ballot box, medical marijuana passed at the ballot box in Michigan in 2008. Uh, and for the next several months to a year, uh, we had a number of potential clients and we had really none of them uh, that were suitable. And part of that is the function of the fact that Michigan law at that point in time didn't really provide for commercial activity. Uh, but it really wasn't until Illinois started their rulemaking process that we started representing uh, business clients. And, and that has obviously you know, changed enormously over the last 16 years. Well, that's, that's it for us today. Uh, thank you for listening along. Again, you can find us at youtube.com slash Dykema. That's D-Y-K-E-M-A. Uh, my name's Lance Boldry, and I look forward to seeing you next time on A Higher Law.